All right, so I'm going to be preaching uh, through Acts 27, but I thought I'd give the, title, the sermon a title so you can see the, the theme running through Acts 27. So, you know, sailing on the sea and the storms of life and shipwreck, the, the Bible uses this analogy, and I think we can learn a lot of lessons just about life, because sometimes life is a, is a journey, and, you know, there's, there's the perils that go and the decisions that get made, and I, I think that's one thing that I think God is teaching us in this chapter that, that definitely spoke to me as I went through this chapter. I, I was thinking, surely there are a lot of life lessons about this journey, because the, the, our faith and our life can be likened to this sailing journey. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves shipwrecked. In, in 1 Timothy 1, it says here, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went, which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, look at this, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So you can see there that our faith can be likened to this journey, and it has perils, it has trials, it has decisions, it has things that happen along the way. And if, you know, like, if we, we don't want to be like Hymenaeus and Alexander, right, who got excommunicated out of a church, and their faith was shipwrecked. You know, they did not end well. Now, we don't know whether they were saved or not, but... Their, their journey in the faith did not end well, like Paul talks about, ending, finishing his course with joy, whom I have delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So I want to look at Acts 27 in that light and pick out some, some factors in this story where we can see, you know, what are the things in this story that help us to survive the storms of life? So let's, let's go through Acts 27. So the first one I have here is they had a target destination. A target destination. What is that? You know, they're having, having a purpose and a mission. And, you know, something that is more than just this life, right? Having something that is an eternal value and purpose. Now, our overarching purpose, yes, is the Great Commission, right? We have a vision to grow a community, to be impactful, to, to get people saved. But... Other people may have other spiritual goals, other things they want to achieve for God, whether it's some good work, some charitable cause, some, you know, some place they want to go, some place they want to reach, or some mission or some ministry that they want to do. But it's important that if we want to survive the storms of life, that we do have goals and aspirations that are greater than just this life. You know, there's a target, that there's a, there's a goal to achieve. Acts 27.1, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. So we know, look, I know in the first century, the apostles had it a bit different to us. I mean, it, it, it does give you a bit more assurance when Jesus himself comes and appears to you and gives you a mission, you know, where Paul has this mission to go to Rome. So he has a mission to go to Rome. Jesus says he's going to be there. But that assurance that Jesus has given him this mission gives him a lot of peace even in that time of storm as he's traveling. And, and he can be like a bulwark of stability for the other people on the ship because of that eternal, you know, and that mission that he has. And yes, we don't have Jesus physically or visually maybe appearing to us, but we have his word. We have a mission from God. And sometimes people, you know, they stress in life and they go through the trials of life and they can't be that stability for the people around them and that stability for their family because they're too focused on the temporal things. But when we, when we remember that our mission is not the temporal, our mission is the eternal, we will be a lot more stable and we can be like the Paul in that journey to our family and to our friends, because we know that there is eternity, there is an afterlife, there is more than this world, and when you have that perspective, like I talk about, an eternal perspective, you don't stress as much over the things you miss out on in this life, over the things that don't work out in this life, right? So you've got to have that target destination. 
that goal that is greater than just this life, and they did too, right? They were trying to go to Rome. They were fulfilling something that Jesus had asked them to do. Paul knew he was going to go there, and that obviously impacted how confident he was in terms of not perishing on the, on the trip over there. So a purpose and a mission to keep you on track that is greater than this temporary life. Because, you know, you can do a lot of traveling in this life. You know, if we're going to use the analogy, you can do a lot of sailing. Like, you can get up to a lot of activity. But to what end? Like, what's the purpose of it? And that's why it's good to reflect on the passages in Ecclesiastes. Because when we think about the purpose of life, there's no greater example in the Bible than Solomon, who tried to experience it all. Because that's what happens when we get caught up in this life, don't we? We want to experience all the things that this life has to offer. And then, unfortunately, that ends up becoming like an idol, where that's what we're living for. That's what we're making money for, which should not be the case. So we have to be reminded from Solomon, who did seek all this, and what was his conclusion? Ecclesiastes 2, nine. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Look, and whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, look at this, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. So Solomon went through all the pleasures of this life, went through all the things that you could enjoy, and he learned this lesson. And he had to go through all that to learn that lesson. I mean, we could learn this lesson from him, just from God's word. But, you know, like we'll learn about in, the, in this chapter in Acts 27, sometimes experience is the best teacher. But, you know, the earlier you can learn this lesson, right, the less of your life you can spend doing things that are vain, vanity and vexation of spirit and have more, you know, treasures laid up in heaven. He says here later on in the chapter in Ecclesiastes 2.15, Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. What is he talking about here? He's talking about death. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. Right? So, so now he's saying that if this life is all there is, what does it even matter if you're wiser? So, you know, he, he, obviously he's reflecting on a, a vain life that is only about pleasure and about uh, like sort of worldly wisdom that is temporary. He's saying, well, I'm dying like the, like, like the idiot. Then what does it matter if I'm wiser? It's because it's not. It's not. There's, a, there's an eternity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. So in, the, in terms of eternity, like if we all die, there's no eternity. What does it matter? Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. Right? So you can do a lot of sailing in this life, but if you don't have that eternal perspective, what's the, what's the point of it all? If it doesn't build up treasures in heaven, it's just vanity and vexation of spirit. And I think it's good to be reminded of that so that we don't spend all our life just doing things that are not fruitful for eternity. Fruitful for eternity. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So let's have that target destination in eternity, in God's will, not in the will of the temporary, of the, of the world. Number two, let's go on. Surviving, so we're talking about factors, you know, surviving the storms of life. Number two, godly company. Godly company. That's what we saw with Paul. You know, Paul was never alone. And one person I want to focus on particular that's mentioned in Acts 27 is this man, Aristarchus. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. Now, not only was Aristarchus with them, you can see that Acts is written in the we, because who wrote Acts? Luke. So Luke is also with them. So you can see Paul in this journey, right? In this, in this journey that we're using as the analogy of life, he is accompanied by other godly men, right? So he's got Aristarchus, he's got Luke, with him. Now, you may not remember that name Aristarchus, right? It says, and the next, I'll just read verse 3 and then we'll go on. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So you see how Paul had 
favour with the, with the Romans, that even when they stopped off at Sidon, that he could go and, um, you know, see people that are there. And they probably trusted him to not, like, run away to, to come back to the ship. So Aristarchus, do you remember Aristarchus? When we go through Acts? Acts 19, do you remember when they went to Ephesus and they wanted to be killed by the Ephesians? Remember Aristarchus was there with him. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius, look, and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theatre. And you see, like, that's where bonds are the strongest, is when you've gone through trials together. You've gone through hard times together. You've served together. This is why it's so important that, you know, they say a church that serves together stays together. Because it's just like here. Paul served with Aristarchus. They've been through the highs and the lows. And that builds not only character, but that strengthens relationships. Just like men that have served in the army together. And you can see there's like a bond between them that is like like almost stronger than family, stronger than blood because of the things that they've endured together. And the spiritual life is the same. That's why we're talking about the spiritual life being likened to a journey but the spiritual life is likened to a war as well because it's very, it's very similar. People that have gone through spiritual fights together have experiences together just like soldiers have together, you know, in the spiritual sense. Aristarchus is one of them. So Aristarchus is mentioned in Philemon, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, right? So Luke, my fellow laborers. So we see Aristarchus getting, you know, in persecution with Paul, Aristarchus serving with Paul, Aristarchus on this journey with Paul, this perilous journey, Aristarchus in prison with Paul, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. So, Godly company is important in surviving the storms of life. And that's why if your company is only worldly company, you may not survive that storm because you're not surrounding yourself with godly company. And, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very important. Why? Because godly company encourages you, refreshes you. It makes you want to endure the things that you would not otherwise endure. Because you may not realize, you know, the, the influence of worldly friends, but they'll make you give up more than you should, right? Give up on the stances, your standards, the things that you should be doing because you feel comfortable around people that aren't doing those things. Whereas when you're around godly company, they spur you, they provoke you unto love and to good work. First Corinthians 16, look at what Paul says here about Stephanus. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus that it is the first fruits of Archaea, and, they, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That ye would submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth, helpeth with us, and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus, and Archaicus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. So you see how not only godly company can make up for your own lack of supply. So here, Paul is talking about physical needs, but, you know, we are all, none of us are perfect spiritually, right? We all have strengths, we all have weaknesses, there are days we're doing well, and there are days we're not doing well. And when you surround yourself with godly company, they can make up for that lack of your own spiritual life, just like here, they made up for the lack physically for Paul's needs. Verse 18, and this is the verse I wanted to focus on just on this point. For they have, look at this, refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. So not only is it, impo- is it important to, be, to have godly company, because we all need to be refreshed, but this is why it's important for you to be godly company too, because you could be refreshing others that you may not otherwise be refreshing that need that refreshing, right? Just like here, you think, Paul, why would Paul need to be refreshed? He's Paul. But Paul says here, man, I am glad, he says here, at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus, because even people like Paul 
need to be refreshed. They need to be surrounded by godly company. And that's why, you know, Paul was not on his own in these, in these journeys. We read many chapters in the Bible where he's talking about people that are with him. Romans 16 is a great example. It's just like a chapter, just a whole list of people that are involved in the church in Rome because he wasn't alone. All right, let's continue. I'm probably spending a bit too long on these points that I plan to, so I'll try and get through them as quickly as possible because I do have a lot to go through. Number three, surviving the storms of life. You have to be open to change. You have to be open to change. So we see here in Acts 27, when we had launched from thence, we sailed unto Cyprus because the winds were contrary. So see, the path that they had intended to go, it was not going that way. The winds were not blowing them that way. They had to go a different route. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, city of Lycia, and there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So you see, it, not even the ship that they had intended to go on was the ship they ended up being on to go to Italy. They had to find another ship to get on to go to Italy. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Sinaitis, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmoni. See, so there, sometimes there are issues in life, there are factors in life that are out of our control. And yeah, we can get sad, we can get angry, we can get discouraged, or we just need to be open to change. Maybe it's just not God's will for us to go that way. So look, we try our best, you know, they tried their best to go that way, the winds were contrary to them, there's things just outside of their control closing that door. So we don't want to be discouraged. Sometimes we have to open our spiritual eyes and realize, hey, that's just not the direction God wants us to go at this time. Acts 27, 8, and hardly passing it, came unto the place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Well, so that, they, you know, they, they didn't intend to go here. This place doesn't sound too bad, right? The Fair Havens. So what's the point here? Just one factor in surviving the storms of life. You know, we have to be open to our own plans being thwarted and not necessarily going down the path that we had planned, and to trust that, you know, God is directing our steps if we are trying to walk in the ways of God. And the Bible refers to this, you know, Proverbs 16, it's two verses, a man's heart deviseth his way. Look, but the Lord directeth his steps. You know, I like this verse because, yeah, we come up with our own plans. We decide what we are trying to do, but sometimes when we go out to do it, we don't always either walk the path that we had sort of determined or end up where we thought we wanted to end up. But we just need to be moving. And this is why I always learnt in my Christian life that we should just be moving, just serving God, walking forward, walking forward. We don't really necessarily know the path that we're going to walk and we don't know where we're going to end up. But we have faith that if we are just walking in God's will, like the word being a light to our feet, a lamp, lamp to our feet, light to our path, right? We walk in the will of God, we can have faith that God will be directing where we're going and we'll end up somewhere where God wants us to be. You know, it's, it's not wrong to have plans, right? But God is directing us. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. It's a, it's a very interesting verse, this one, because you never really know who the he is referring to. <laughs> you know, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. So it's like, is it the man delighting in the Lord's way? Is it the Lord delighting in the man's way? Is, uh, you know, is it the Lord delighting in the way that he's... Uh, you know, so uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, the, the, the pronouns there and, the, and what antecedents they might refer to. So we have to be open to change. Don't be discouraged if things don't work out as planned. A great example of this in the Bible was Joseph. You, know, you think he planned to be thrown in a pit and sold into slavery... But, you know, we, we learn the lesson of Joseph where he says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. So we need to be open to change because sometimes in life, things don't always work out the way you want them to. Don't be discouraged. Just keep serving God. Keep walking in, the, in, the, in, in God's light in the right way, doing the right thing and God will direct your step. Let's go on. Number four, surviving the storms of life. Follow godly counsel. Follow godly counsel. Let's look in Acts 27, 9. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, 
Paul admonished them. So I was reading a bit up about this because I was wondering what this fast is. A lot of people are saying this is the, the Day of Atonement, uh, which was one of the feasts celebrated in the Old Testament. And this feast, the Day of Atonement, they would, they would afflict themselves. So this is why it says the fast was now already passed because there was a day, the Bible says, you afflict your souls and not do any work therein. So obviously they would be fasting on this Day of Atonement. It wasn't a feast where they were actually feasting. It was a special day where they would be fasting. So this fast is passed, but the reason why this is significant here is because I believe Paul traveling a lot you know, you, you start to know sort of the seasons and things like that. So I think Paul here, I don't, I don't know if it was necessarily just a supernatural revelation for him to say, look, this is going to be a dangerous journey. I think it was more Paul from experience knew that at this time of the year, after the fast, that the seas were quite tempestuous. And he was trying to, you know, he was trying to give them some advice just from his own experience. But here it says here, you know, he said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. So you can, you can imagine the scenario here that it's like, well, Paul, you're a preacher. What do you know about, you know, tra traveling in a ship? But then, you know... People can have wisdom, not necessarily it's just their specialty, but, you know, they can have wisdom in life here. But not only that, even if it was like a supernatural revelation to Paul, you can already see in this chapter, I mean, things can't go well if Paul is saying one thing and the master of the ship are saying other things. I mean, you'd likely go with Paul, right? You're going to go with the godly counsel. And this is where, even in the analogy of this story here, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing one path of advice being given by Paul, who's representing godly counsel, and then we see another path of advice, which is the world, where, yeah, in the world's wisdom, you would think that the master and owner of the ship knows what's best to do in this journey. But no, we should be following God's will, and God, you know, by faith in God's word, you know, they should have went with what Paul was saying. And because the haven, verse 12, was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also. So winter in the King James Bible is like to stay somewhere. I know we use that as a season, but when it says it's commodious to winter in, that's where they're, they're staying there. The more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice, and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest, and when the south wind blew softly, Supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. So what is that referring to here? They're seeing the winds and they're saying, oh, it's like Paul is saying, I think this is going to be, this is going to be a dangerous journey and there's going to be a lot of perils. I don't think we should lose. The ship goes, but then they're looking at the weather and saying, well, the winds have stopped I and mean, it's all right. It's sort of like if it stops raining, you think, oh, it's okay, but then you drive right into a storm. That's pretty much what's happening here. So my fourth point is, you know, we need to follow godly counsel. The centurion took heed to the master instead of Paul. So we need to be wary of that in our spiritual life, that there is this conflict between the right thing to do, the wrong thing to do, good advice, bad advice, and it happens in different areas of life. You know, Galatians 5, I won't read these verses for the sake of time because we're quite familiar with them, but, you know, we have the challenge of the spirit and the flesh. And there is that, you know, that contention of which do you take heed to? The spirit of, of the flesh. Obviously take, you know, go to the spirit. If you fulfill the lusts of the flesh, that can cause a lot of problems in your life. And people do, you know, whether it's drugs, whether it's fornication, whether it's covetousness, and you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, these things can cause a lot of problems. It can create storms in your life, you know, following the world, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, going down the worldly path rather than the godly path, that can lead into a lot of sin. So like it did in Acts 27. Proverbs 1, look at what Proverbs 1 says in regards to counsel, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, 
and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. See, children, you know, if you listen to the advice of your parents, that also can help you to avoid a lot of the pitfalls that your parents know are out there. You know, like children, just think, you know, they know, they think they're invincible. You know, your parents have traveled those seas before you, like Paul has traveled those seas before. He's giving them some advice to not go down the same paths. And you don't want to be like you think you know better. You know, you should take heed to that advice. Like Proverbs is saying here, he says, my son, hear the instruction of thy father, forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace about unto thy neck and chains about thy neck. All right, let's move on. Now we get into the actual storm. Survive the storm. Acts 27, 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. So you see, like, they... they, they, they get into Clauda, they've got to like fix the boat and like it's a, it's a perilous place and, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighten the ship and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So this scenario here describing the despair and the danger is, is very similar to life. Because if you make bad decisions in life, you can find yourself in these terrible situations, right? These terrible situations that are not only dangerous, you know, you, you can lose valuable things, you know, if you make wrong decisions in life, it can feel like despair. You know, people that come along, come, you know, they make wrong financial decisions or they have, they made bad relationship decisions and now they're in a situation where they just feel hopeless. That's what this is like. You feel like you lost control of the situation. And that's why it's so important that you take heed to godly counsel, that you try to minimize the amount of foolish decisions made in your life because when you you know, go through the consequences of those foolish decisions. This is what it feels like. You've lost control. You, you, can, you can lose a lot of things in life. And, you know, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So that's one lesson we can learn here. Now, just because you're in a storm, it doesn't necessarily mean you've made bad decisions. Yes, bad, bad decisions can create storms, but even good decisions can create storms as well. So it's not just the presence of a storm that determines whether you are or are not in the will of God. And that's why the analogy of a storm works really well, because not only can storms be created by your own, you know, your own decisions in life, poor decisions in life, but you might be doing the right thing and be in a storm. So you need to sort of stand back and reflect on life. Just because a storm is happening, that doesn't mean you're not where God wants you to be. Mark 4, you know, here's another storm. It says, The same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there rose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he who, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? So that's a great story where the disciples were in a storm. And you can see Jesus, even in the midst of a storm, is sleeping. So he had the peace of God <laughs> in that storm. But the disciples 
were not. You know, they were fearful. They said, they said to Jesus, I mean, they even doubted Jesus' care for them in that storm. And doesn't that, isn't that what we do? When we're going through hard times, we start to doubt whether God cares, whether we have the love of God, even though God is in the ship with us. Jesus is in the ship with him, and he says, you know, why are you doubting? You know, thou, you, know you, you have little faith. And why is it that, how is it that you have no faith? So just because you're going through a storm, that doesn't mean you're not exactly where Jesus wants you to be and Jesus being with you going through that storm, like we see in Mark 4. But, you know, many, lives, many problems in life can be avoided by taking heed to godly counsel. Um, so sometimes the storms that we create are of our own doing. Proverbs 129, further down the chapter in Proverbs 1, for they... For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. I also wanted to share with you here Proverbs 11, 14. Look what it says here. Where no counsel is, the people fall... But in the multitude of counselors, look at this, there is safety. All right, let's go on. Now, number six, number six I've titled, Trust God. Trust God. Acts 27, 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. Right, so I think Paul has good intentions here. You know, sometimes we remind people of their failures because, you know, we're trying to get revenge, trying to make ourselves feel better. You know, I think Paul, you know, he's reminding them, obviously, that he had given them advice to not go down this route. Um, you know, and sometimes experience in life is the best teacher. And we make bad decisions, we go through those experiences, and sometimes it is good for us because it humbles us and you can see here in Acts 27, I think that's what God is showing us here, that they made this poor decision. They're now living through the consequences of their decision. And Paul, sort of representing the voice of God here, they're now open to, to Paul's counsel. And now you can see here, Paul kind of becomes like the captain of the soldiers and the captain of the ship, where he is actually now commanding what's going on in this ship, right? Which is what they should have done at the beginning. He should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to gain this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. So this is also a great uh, analogy here, this verse here in verse 22, of salvation. So they're going through this journey and obviously Paul is talking about this specific scenario. It's not that every shipwreck that they'll lose the ship and not their own lives. But the spiritual lesson we take away from Acts 27, I think this is a picture here of salvation. That no matter the storm you go through, we're talking about tr having tr faith in God. We know that we are saved no matter what. And that can give us some strength to go through that storm. Like here. He's telling them you will not die. You will survive this trip, but we will lose the ship, right? So it's a loss. They'll lose the ship, but I think hearing those reassuring words from Paul, like when we hear the reassuring words of our Savior, that helps us to go through a lot of the things we go through in life, some tough times. For there stood by me this night the angel of God whom I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and, lo, God hath, give, hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So, yes, Paul might have had that assurance through that vision, but he's now giving that assurance just like we're getting that assurance through God's word. They have to have faith in Paul's word. We are having faith in God's word. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. So the words will have no impact on you if you don't know them and if you don't believe them. You can't get that comfort from God's word 
if you don't have God's word with you. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. So trials humble you. You know, they bring you closer to God. Now the sailors and the soldiers, um, their hearts are now more open to Paul's counsel. So I think it's the same. Salvation and eternal security helps us go through what life can throw at us. And this is why I love, we went through Romans 8, 38, 39 with the kids this morning. But we'll read it here for you as well. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, that's uh, relevant to Acts 27, isn't it? Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's go on. Number seven. Number seven, surviving the storms of life, we are better together. We are better together. Yes, I understand, you know, any group of people can have conflicts, can get on each other's nerves, you know, can rub each other the wrong way, but I truly believe, even after all that, we are still better together because we need to fight this fight together. There is a greater enemy and just even you here and see here in Acts 27, you see sailors on the ship trying to look out for their own interests. Like you see in any group, people are out for their own interests. Conflicts can happen here. They're trying to steal the boats off the ship and leave deserting the people on the ship. But Paul knows, you know, that they need the sailors, right? So they're better off together. When the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they'd gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 50 fathoms. See, so they were worried they weren't going to make it to land, but they knew they were close and they were going to desert the people on the ship. And there wasn't a few people on the ship. Like when you read later on in the chapter, you know, you think this is Paul and a band of merry men, you know, maybe 10, 15, but there's 200 odd people on this ship. Then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under the color, I guess that phrase is like under color of night, right? As though they would have cast anchors out of the fortress. So they were pretending to cast anchors out, but they're actually lowering down like those little dinghies to like, you know, go. Paul said to the centurion, so again, we don't know whether Paul is just aware of what's going on, but, or it's supernatural revelation, but he says, you know, these sailors desert us, we're also going to perish as well. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. So not in, they didn't just like you know, get it. maybe they cut it off because you see later they're actually trying to remove weight from the ship so that they can do this last leg. They just don't even allow them to escape at all. Just like, you know, you're, 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 you're with us. <laughs> There's no way to, to get off the, the ship now. They just cut off the ropes and just desert the boats. But what's the lesson here with st the storms of life? We're better together. We are better together. And I hope you remember that, you know, because contention is inevitable. You know, people rub each other the wrong way, but we are better together, just like the soldiers and the sailors are better together because it's like a body. Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they can have heat, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I won't read through 1 Corinthians 12 because you guys are familiar with this passage, but I'm just bringing that same lesson of, you know, we're a body. There's different purposes for each person in this church. We're all needed, just like on that ship. You know, they needed the soldiers. They needed Paul, obviously. 
and they needed the sailors to get them there safely so they're better off together in that ship with God sailing to their destination. Number eight. Number eight surviving the storms of life is you need to make sure you take care of your health. You need to take care of your health. I know we're in a spiritual battle, but we can't be like your average Baptist preacher that's just in this spiritual battle and he's like, you know, 100 kilos overweight, right? You need to take care of your health because when you take care of your health, you will be more effective at going through the storms of life. You know, even the world teaches us that exercise and, and, diet, and good diet, if it's bad, it can lead to like depression and, you know, not having the right frame of mind and, you know, not overcoming those things. I think that is some wisdom just of the physicality that it, it is actually something that uh, is supported by the Bible as well. You need to take care of your health. And this is what Paul is saying here because, look, they're so focused on this storm, rebuilding the ship, you know, trying to stay alive, like fighting in this fight. And sometimes life is like that. You get so carried away with life, making money, getting all your ducks in a row, taking care of your family, taking care of the children, going to this activity, that you're in this, you're in this sort of journey and this storm that you neglect your health. You don't get enough sleep. You don't eat well. You're not eating regularly. When you eat, you just eat like a piece of cake and have a, and a, and a cup of coffee. And it's just like you're not doing your body any favors. You know, you, maybe you're putting on weight. Maybe you're tired all the time. You're not eating, you're not exercising. So you don't have the same amount of energy because your metabolism is dropped. All these sorts of things. And you may think you're in a righteous cause. Just like the sailors. The sailors are thinking, man, if we don't keep this ship together, we're going to die. Just like you think, if I don't keep my life together, it's going to fall apart. But part of keeping your life together and part of them keeping the ship together and making this journey is they needed to eat. They needed to take care of their health. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, this day is the 14th day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Now, a lot of commentary on this verse is saying that this is not like an extension of the fast that he was talking about before. This is just referring to them, like I said, just being so engrossed in surviving that they are not eating properly. They're not resting. That's what he's referring to here. So for 14 days, they're not taking care of themselves. And he says, hey, we've got to take some time to rest, some time to eat, you know, and just trust God that things will not fall apart. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat for this, look at this, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. So you see, trust God that you can take some rest, that things won't just fall to pieces, and you, can, you need to take some time to take care of your health, right? Exercise, eat well, get enough rest, drink enough water, just the basics. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all, and when he had broken it, he began to eat. Now look at this. Then were they all of good cheer. And they also took some meat. And we were all in the ship. Look at this. Look how many people are in the boat. 200, three score, and 16 souls. So what's that? 200, three score is 60, 16, 76. 276 people on that boat. You know, and anyone you always see like pictures of Jesus in the boat, the disciples are always like this little dinghy, right? This is, this is a big boat, you know? So this is a big ship. It's transporting a lot of people, transporting a lot of things. I want to show you this example in the Bible. Sorry, I know I'm preaching a lot, but hopefully it's interesting. This example in the Bible of making sure you take care of your health. Because even the, the best of us, like Paul here, he understood you've got to take care of his health. But also Elijah. Elijah, look at how Elijah is dealt with. I don't know if you've ever read this passage. But you, you, we know 1 Kings 18, because 1 Kings 18 was the, the prophets of Baal and Mount Carmel. Do you remember that? And he killed them all. 1 Kings 19, this is after. He's had that great victory on Mount Carmel, and now Jezebel is out to kill him. So he flees into the mountain. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life, as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So you see how now Jezebel's out for Elijah. So he's fled, fled. And when he saw that, he arose, went for his life, came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. 
but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. So you see, even after a great victory, even the best of men have lows, right? They can go through some depressing times where they're discouraged, right? And they don't even want to live like Elijah here. And look at what God's response to him is. It says, as he, slept, as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, look at this, arise and eat. Isn't that interesting? He's, he's, he's discouraged. You know, he's probably journeying. He's probably not eating properly. And God just says, here's some food. Just eat. Like Paul in Acts 27. You guys have been fasting for 14 days. I know. Just make sure you're taking care of your health. Just eat because it is impacting you spiritually. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. So he's eating and drink. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. So what is he doing? He's resting. He's eating. Because right? after a huge battle, you need, to, you need a bit of R&R. &R, right? So there's nothing wrong with R&R. &R. You need to take care of your health. You need to rest. You need to eat. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. You see? So it's not like God came and just said, You slacker, like, are you? No, it's, not, it's all right to rest and to get some food and, and, to, to, and to recuperate. And he arose, look at this, and did eat and drink, now look at this, and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights under horror of the Mount of God. So you see how you could go further if you just stop, take care of your health. You're going to do more. You're going to be more effective in your life. You're going to be more effective for God if you take care of your health. And you've got to live longer, maybe. And some people, they die early. You know, they don't even finish the journey that maybe they could have physically because they don't take care of their health. And, you know, if you lose 20 years of your life, that's 20 years that you couldn't serve God. 20 years you couldn't lay up treasures in heaven. 20 years of soul winning that other people may have got saved. Like, you know, you lose your life, you, you lose out on things. All right, I'll try and go through these a bit quicker. I promise I'll try and finish before 11.30. Remove, number nine, there's a few more quick ones. Number nine, remove the weights. Acts 27, and when they'd eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. So before in the storm, they lost things in the storm. But here now, they are removing weights so that the ship can move faster because now they know they're close to land, right? They're going to, you know, they, they're taking some risks now. They're going, they, they're lightening the ship. So the analogy here, I think, is we've got to remove those weights in our life that are holding us back. We've got to lift up the anchors that are holding us in place, remove the unnecessary weight, you know, cut off those boats that we don't need, you know, the escape plan, and then, you know, go ahead on the ship that we are with God, like we were with Paul. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. So now it's just a description of the actual crashing of the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoised up the mainsail to wind and made toward shore. So even now they're going the way, they're together, they've lightened the ship, they're going. It's still not a smooth journey, is it, in life? You know, they crash landing, and they jump off the ship, and then they're holding on to like face on the floor, but then they, they get to land, they make it. You know, it doesn't mean they're not in the will of God, but it's, you know, sometimes life feels like this. Yeah, and that's why this is a, a great chapter. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And uh, I, I read, you know, about this chapter that, you know, when they're in the storm, that even though it says the sun and the stars are all, you know, darkened out by the clouds, yet, you know, their target, going to Rome, you know, following the Lord Jesus Christ, that was the light of faith that they were following. And it's like that in our life. You know, sometimes when all things seem dark, you still have looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So like it says here, we have the sin that doth beset us, and we lay aside the weight. 
So like in Acts 27, they had the anchors stopping them from moving. That's like your sin. So we have to lift up those anchors so that we can start moving. But if we want to move faster, we need to remove those weights from our life. What are the weights? They're the things that you can live without, right? The things that are not necessary. And, you know, sometimes we have too many of those in our life and it doesn't allow us to travel as far as we could. Just the vain things in life, the, the riches, the cares of this life and the pleasures of this life. So we need to remove the weights. Get rid of the thorns, like in Luke 8, 14. The thorns are the, the cares, the riches and pleasures of this life, and it will make us bring no fruit to perfection. All right, this is the last one, number 10. Number 10, just the last couple of verses of Acts 27, surviving the storms of life. So we remove the weights, and you need to be willing to get uncomfortable. You need to be willing to get uncomfortable. You know, a lot of us didn't come from Christian homes. So we didn't grow up with going soul winning, going to church, dressing a certain way, speaking a certain way. Change is going to make you feel uncomfortable. And that's normal. It's part of the spiritual growing process. And you need to be willing to get out of your comfort zone if you want to live a life pleasing to God because it's going to be different to where you came from. Right? It'll be different to how you lived before, so just expect that it's not going to feel normal at the beginning. But you got to get uncomfortable. Like here, Acts 27, falling into a place where two seas met. They ran the ship aground, and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So how I see this, it's almost like and this is not a picture of salvation, because salvation, God gets you all the way to salvation. But in the storms of life, sometimes God only gets you so far, and he's not taking you the rest of the way. You've got to jump out and do your part, right? Get uncomfortable and swim the rest of the way, right? Like here. So the four parts stuck fast, Remained unmoved. Now the hinder part was broken. So they're, imagine, they're on this ship, it's stuck, and it's a bit like the Titanic movie, right? It's just slowly like breaking, like the waves are just breaking the ship. So it's only a matter of time where you think, I've, I've got to jump into this water. And the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. So, I mean, you can think of all different analogies here where it's like, you know, you know there's, a, there's like Satan trying to kill us or whatnot, but, you know, because... There with Paul, Paul even saved the prisoners. So there were other prisoners there with Paul, but I think that's another picture of salvation, that if you're on the ship with God, like Paul is representing, he saved you from the wrath of the, of the soldiers, even though, you know, if he wasn't there, then you, he would have perished, and, 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 and he would have, they would have killed them all. They, they said, the, the soldiers initially didn't even want the prisoners to escape. They're probably fearing their own lives. That's part of it as well. They're just going to kill them all. But Paul says kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. See, so verse 44, and the rest, some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. So in life, God may only get you so far, and you are you need to get uncomfortable. You need to take some risks because you may need to jump off the boat. And whether you can swim or whether you hold on to a piece of the ship or some piece of furniture, but look, you know, this last passage, it reminds me of the, the crypto saying, right? Was it wag me? We're all going to make it. You know, so we're saved. You know, we're on that boat. doesn't matter. It's hard. You know, you take the risk. All the things we talked about in this sermon... But at the end of it, we, we were all going to make it. You know? Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So in conclusion, hope that this sermon brings this chapter to life for you. You know, there's a lot of lessons you can learn from God's word. You know, so surviving the storms of life, have a target destination. Have godly company. Be open to change. You know, follow godly counsel. Survive the storm. You know, just because you're going through a storm, that doesn't mean you're not in God's will. 
trust God. You know, we know we're saved no matter what. You know, that, that faith helps us. We're better together. Make sure you take care of your health, your physical health. Remove the weights and be prepared to get out of your comfort zone. Get uncomfortable. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this chapter and thank you for the encouragement of the analogy of storms and how it's just so applicable to our own life. So we thank you, Lord, how you reveal to us, how you help us through the storms of life. Um, We pray, Lord, that you'll give us the grace and the strength to do our part in that storm. And uh, Lord, you know, thank you for trying us because it reminds us of your love. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to grow and to mold, to be more like Jesus Christ. We pray and ask these things in his precious name. Amen.